Hey guys, time for a very exciting Tech News Day. Tidal. Hmm. Now that's a name we haven't heard in a very long time. Great Fiona Apple album. This isn't that, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Now last time that we actually talked about Tidal, the mm -hmm. streaming service, I looked this up. It was uh, seven months ago. Oh, jeez. And the news then was that they were putting on a big concert to raise money for hurricane relief. All right. Because even the companies that we dog on deserve credit where it's due. We're fair. This time, though, it's back to the doghouse for Tidal because they're in big, big trouble. Yes. It turns out that the streaming service, which unlike Spotify or Apple Music, is owned by artists like Jay-Z. Uh, therefore, it would have artists' best interests in mind. Uh, it actually may have been screwing over its artists. Not all its artists, though. Uh, the allegations published by Norwegian newspaper Dagens Næringsliv, Næringsliv, Dagens Næringsliv, which translate to today's business, are that Tidal has been artificially inflating the play counts for Beyonce and Kanye West. And because of the way revenue works on this kind of subscription streaming service, that means that Beyonce and Kanye earned more than they should have, while other artists, they earned less. Yeah, basically with Tidal or Spotify or YouTube Red, mm -hmm. your monthly fee is divided up with a certain amount going straight to the service, and then the rest divided up between the creators whose works you are enjoying. Mm -hmm. There's other factors, but in theory, if you use your Tidal account to listen to 10 hours of Beyonce and 10 hours of, I don't know, Jake Cole in any given month, both those artists should receive pretty much equal portions of your subscription fee. But allegedly, that didn't happen here. Uh, today Business, the Daggins Naren Slip, says that uh, they were given a hard drive containing Tidal's internal company play data, and when they looked at it, they found suspicious play counts for Beyonce's ongoing Tidal exclusive album, Lemonade, and Kanye's The Life of Pablo, which was a Tidal exclusive for a while after it was released. One user had supposedly streamed Lemonade in full 15 times in one day. But when the newspaper reached out to this user, she said, I love Beyonce, but 11 hours? No. <laughs> That's of course anecdotal, and hey, maybe she got drunk on a little of that hard lemonade. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe she did that, she set the album on loop and then fell asleep for 11 hours. A anything's possible. Maybe she set it on loop and listened to it a couple times, got up, went to the store, did her daily activities, came yeah. back, still playing. There's one guy on 4chan whose iTunes library just consists of in the end by Linkin Park, and he's listened to it thousands of times. Okay, there you go. So anything's possible. Mm -hmm. But Dagens Nærsliv, which sounds like it's a backwards word, but it's really just the name of a Norwegian newspaper. Yeah, reverse our audio, see what it sounds like. Uh, they say they've seen enough data to conclude that Tidal has fabricated, fabricated 320 million false streams, which is shady as hell, yeah. but so is anonymously receiving a hard drive full of insider company data. So Tidal's official stance is that the data is bullshit, and this is all a plot to drag their good name through the dirt. Here's their official statement, which reads like the kind of statement Scientology would give out when they, every time they're criticized. Mm -hmm. This is a smear campaign from a publication that once referred to our employee as an Israeli intelligence officer and her owner as a crap dealer. We expect nothing less from them than this ridiculous story, lies and falsehoods. The information was stolen and manipulated, and we will fight these claims vigorously. Well, they mean business. Now, to be fair, Dagen's Nering Sliv has previously published pieces critical of Tidal, though they were less ad hominem and more about stuff like Tidal falsely inflating its user numbers. For this latest story, they even sent the data off to the Norwegian University of Science and Technology to be analyzed by experts. And they issued a report stating, quote, there has in fact been a manipulation of the data at particular times. The manipulation appears targeted towards a very specific set of track IDs related to two distinct albums. What could those two albums be? It's Lemonade and Life Pop. Oh. Anyway, after that new story was published, uh, it turned out it was just the first of several articles Dagas Nerg's Live would be publishing throughout a year-long investigation of uh, Tidal, and in sub subsequent articles, the allegations get even worse. Tidal has allegedly been paying record labels less than they owe without renegotiating their terms, which has prompted musician and recording industry groups in Norway and Denmark to file complaints with law enforcement and demand audits of all of Tidal's numbers. They're also allegedly uh, way behind on actually paying any of their royalties to several major record labels, which multiple Norwegian labels have confirmed is true, with one saying that they haven't received any payments from Tidal since October. And these are supposed to be monthly payments. Mm. All those black metal bands in Norway are going to be very upset. Very upset. They're going to start burning churches down again. Mm -hmm. Now, you may be wondering just why the hell Norway in particular is so interested in Tidal. And that's because, if you remember, uh, Tidal's parent company, Aspiro, is primarily based there. When Jay-Z and others bought Aspiro, they basically just reskinned Aspiro's existing streaming service, WIMP, for the US and international market. 
It's unclear, but we assume if these issues are in fact valid for Scandinavian labels and publishers, this is probably also an issue for labels and publishers worldwide. But time will tell if this scandal is as huge and international as it seems. Uh, it'll definitely be interesting to see how this plays out over the next couple of weeks and whether or not these claims are true. Yeah, and who's responsible? Because mm -hmm. it's like, I don't know. Like the fact that the it was Kanye and Beyonce's albums, like that seems really suspicious, yeah. but I highly doubt Kanye West and Beyonce were like on the phone with Norway being like, you better get those numbers right. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's, 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 it's very, uh, I'm very curious where on the chain of command this decision might have come from. Who knows? But uh, great to have Tidal back. We miss you so much. Mm -hmm. Hope everything's going well. Yeah, moving on. Last week, Google held their annual Google I.O. event where they unveil what's coming in the next version of Android along with other upcoming changes to their products. And this year, it's all about AI, baby. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence helping users be more efficient. Uh, Gmail is learning from you and finishing your sentences for you. Android's gonna learn your habits to save battery life. Google Assistant's getting new celebrity voices like John Legend for some reason. And Google News is gonna know exactly what kind of news you wanna read. But that's all boring fluff compared to the biggest news out of Google I.O. Google Duplex. Mmm, finally, a place to live. No, uh, Google Duplex basically allows you to say, okay, Google, call up the local barber shop and give me a haircut appointment for tomorrow between 2 and 4 p.m. And then Google Assistant actually fucking calls the place and has a convincing conversation with the person on the other end to set up your appointment for you. It's something that you would assume would be a broken mess, but in Google's demonstrations, it was able to handle all the variables of this kind of conversation with ease. Yeah, it's a remarkable achievement, but uh, it's also creepy as hell. The demo conversations were way too convincing, way too natural. Ugh. Talking to a shitty automated bot when you call the bank or whatever, it's annoying, but at least you know it's a bot. Mm -hmm. Anyway, immediately following this demonstration, questions were raised about the ethics and legality of all this, and Google clarified that the final product will identify itself as a machine, and it'll also get around those pesky eavesdropping laws, like here in California, by announcing that the call is being recorded. Mm -hmm. So, no one's gonna be fooled. A lot of call no. centers gonna be going out of business, though. Yeah, so yeah, that's the weirdest aspect of this. It's the idea that, in all likelihood, once this kind of tech hits the market, a lot of these conversations are gonna have AI bots on both sides of the conversation, since this tech is just as useful for businesses as it is for customers. It will What be, are they gonna talk to each other about? The ultimate test is going to be saying, call Comcast and cancel my cable. Yeah. Can you do it? Like, it can, it can order me like Chinese food, but can it negotiate? Yeah, I need Google negotiation skills. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's so much tech news now, it's like, wow, that's cool, but... Mm, it's scary. I don't know. It's like most things today, it's scary and convenient. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh. Another Google news though, if the AI in Google Duplex creeps you out, imagine how creepy Google's plans for creating AI for the military must be that uh, a dozen Google employees have actually quit the company in protest. It's, oh! Yeah, if, if it's making them nervous <laughs> and they're leaving a decent paid job, then uh, buckle up, folks. Yeah, Google is providing AI tech to a US Department of Defense program called Project Maven, and it's caused not only those dozen or so employees to quit, but also prompted another 4,000 employees to sign an internal petition asking Google to end their military contract and refuse all future military work. Uh, there's also another external petition asking for the same thing from the International Committee for Robot Arms Control, signed by over 700 professors and researchers. But they're still gonna do it. Yeah, probably. Yeah, as, as for what exactly Google's providing the Department of Defense, uh, it seems to be AI technology that can quickly analyze military drone footage and classify images of objects and people. The problem for Google employees who oppose this is that drones kill people by raining fire down from the sky, and they often result in the deaths of innocent people. This isn't really something that these Google Googlers really signed up for or want on their conscience. No. That's understandable. Yes. Uh, Google's higher ups claim that their AI will lead to less collateral damage from drones, but I don't know, the opinion of many of Google is, uh, that's great, but what if we just didn't involve ourselves in military drones at all? How about that? Yeah. That'd probably be the easier <laughs> way to do it. Well, maybe we just don't associate with uh, weapons of war. We're a fucking. What's the chance company? that one thing goes wrong <laughs> yeah. in the in the next couple of decades in history for Google? That's another thing. It's like, because even you, if one you thing know goes this, wrong, the second this goes wrong, the Department of Defense is not going to take fucking any responsibility no, for it's it. All like, oh God, Google, what did you do? Jeez. Hmm. 
That's why we've been clicking all those images to prove we're not robots, so it can identify yeah. people. <laughs> and is that how a many, road sign or a person? How many of these squares contain terrorists? <laughs> yeah, that's the new. That's the new. Oh, uh, my favorite uh, butterfly meme. I was like, yeah. is this a street sign? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but hey, as controversial as all that is, Google's reputation is still in a lot better shape than Facebook. Case in point, a few years ago, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife donated $75 million to a hospital in San Francisco, and now a group of nurses there are lobbying to have Zuckerberg uh, have his name removed from the building. Uh, and in one protest, they even taped over the word Zuckerberg in Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center. So yeah, that's that happened. You know you fucked up when even your $75 million charitable donations are considered bad PR. Yeah. Wow. That'll teach you to be charitable, Zuck. Yeah. So uh, that toxicity around the Zuckerberg brand, it of course stems from multiple sources. There's the whole scandal where Cambridge Analytica and an unknown number of other data firms used Facebook apps to harvest user data with impunity for years and then use that data to plan the marketing for political campaigns. They're now under one? investigation. Oh, we're getting to that. Oh, good. Uh, and then there's the completely unrelated but still political scandal of Russian government employees creating pages and ads under false pretenses to amplify the political divisions in the U.S. during the lead up to the 2016 election. Yeah, so getting back to that, uh, the latest on the Cambridge Analytica side of things is that despite Cambridge Analytica shutting down and soon declaring bankruptcy, they are now under investigation from the U.S. Justice Department and the FBI over their financial dealings. And the latest on the whole Russian election meddling scandal is that we now have a very clear picture of what sort of stuff Russia's internet research agency was actually posting on Facebook, thanks to a huge data dump by Democrats on the House of Representatives Select Committee on Intelligence. Yeah, previously we'd only seen a few examples of these Russian ads, but now there are thousands that you can go look at right now. As we've previously known, though, these Russian ads weren't specifically about getting Trump elected. They were mainly about specific issues like border security, immigration, the Second Amendment, LGBT rights, and racial activism. And they played both sides of these issues because the goal here was just to get Americans mad at each other and more divided. Mm -hmm. Their biggest targets seem to have been black Americans with pages like... No. Their main targets seem to have been black Americans with pages amplifying the Black Lives Matter movement and highlighting instances of police brutality, as well as Southern conservatives with pages focusing on nationalism, patriotism, Blue Lives Matter, Christianity, and so on, you get it. Mm -hmm. uh, looked at as a whole, these ads are absolutely fucking fascinating because anyone who uses Facebook has seen this kind of thing all over their timeline and wouldn't have had any reason to assume a Russian government agency was behind it. Yeah. They did a very convincing job. Yeah. This still just looks like my idiot family members. Yeah, it looks like shit your dumb relatives who actually use Facebook all the time post while yeah. you sign in once a week to check if you've been invited to any birthday parties. Exactly. And then laugh because you're above all of this. Back to Twitter I go. Yes. To engage in intellectual debates with other people about whether they're saying Laurel or they're saying Yanny. Yanny. What a dumb, I mean. Okay, I, so when I, when I saw this, I immediately, immediately, without hesitation, put on my tinfoil hat and said, something fucked up's happening right now that we are being misdirected on because this is the dumbest bullshit I've ever seen just tossed into the social media ether. I don't know. I, it's pretty fascinating because I, I was like, oh, whatever. I played it. I heard Well, yet, they're on different frequencies. They are. Yeah, it's, it's an old trick. It's, yeah. it's not new, but like, so I put it on literally, the, and it's just repeating itself. First three times I heard Yanny. I'm like, okay, so it's Yanny. And then immediately something in my brain switched to Laurel and that's all I could hear. And it was, it was, I'd say it was noteworthy enough that if I had listened to it 24 hours earlier when it was trending, yeah. it would be worth commenting on. Yeah, well, the thing is, is like this in the dress, I feel like it's it like someone's been, been saving this and they're just like, deploy the Yanny Laurel. <laughs> because it's like, this came out of nowhere. It, it, there, there's no fucking point to it. And all it did was take over social media for a day straight. I hate it so much. And we already went through this back in 2012 with bacon and beer can. Beer can. Yeah. I don't know what he said, guys, you tell me. Yeah, God. Anyway, speaking of being American and upset, let's bring in the most upset American in the building, Phil Larigo, because he's gonna get us even more dang upset. Ah, so much going on, breaking news all over the place. I'm gonna hit like a million topics today and just fly through them all. So first off, net neutrality has passed. The Senate vote, which is awesome, 
It now has to go to the House, where we don't know uh, what, what its fate is there, but anyone who called, tweeted, uh, thank you all. This is really great for us, and keep going. We're probably gonna do this again a couple more times, and then who knows how many more after that. But anyway, I never know what's going on with Trump and how he feels about anything. Let's just pick one. Boop, 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 how he feels about China. Um, he's threatening a trade war one minute, the next minute he's helping out Chinese smartphone maker ZTE. Let's just, let's just go to a Trump tweet for reference. President Xi of China and I are working together to give massive Chinese phone company ZTE a way to get back into business fast. Too many jobs in China lost. Commerce Department has been instructed to get it done. That sounds cool, except for the fact that ZTE had to suspend their operations because they violated sanctions on North Korea and Iran, and they were fined $1.2 billion for lying to authorities. That's weird. Oh, and the minor detail that the Pentagon, you know, the US Pentagon banned ZTE and Huawei phones from sale on military bases, you know, because they're both Chinese made phones and because the, our government suspects they may pose a significant security risk, seems, seems counterproductive. So why is Trump trying to save them right now? I don't have a clue. Uh, do they have dirt on him? Is he just trolling people? Is he a 4D, maybe 5D? Is he playing 5D chess? Who knows? Let's go. Next story. What do we got? We, ah, Trump's still. All right. Let me sweeten this pot for you. Let me throw AT&T in there for good measure. Okay. There's a lot to unpack in the whole AT&T and Time Warner merger, but let me give you the newest updates as quickly and simply as possible. So it appears that AT&T paid $600,000 for, quote, insights into understanding the new administration. And while that might not sound like bad at face value, that 600K went to Essential Consultants, which is the shell corporation of Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen. You go, where's that name? Why does that sound familiar? Yes, it's the same shell corporation that paid $130,000 to porn star Stormy Daniels to stay quiet. Now, congressional Democrats want to know, like, hey, AT&T, did you pay the president's lawyer $600,000 to see how you could position your merger so that he would approve it? Essentially, I don't know. Is this some sort of weird bribe? Uh, they, they got questions. And there's all sorts of scandals brewing with payments to and from Cohen since the Stormy Daniels story broke. And a couple hours before we taped this right here, Trump released his annual disclosure of personal finances, which shows that he paid Cohen between $100,000 and $250,000. Almost like he's paying him back for doing some stuff. Now, I didn't really get a chance to like dig into this thing because it's like 92 pages, but the update on today's news is big because these payments took place in 2016, but did not appear on Trump's 2017 report. They appeared in his 2018 report released today. So this is kind of a big deal because it's sort of like if you made a bunch of money in 2016 and didn't report it until 2018 on your taxes because you got audited and you were like, huh, Oh, these old payments? No, nah, I mean, we got no big deal. Moving on. Enough Trump. I'm done. Let's talk about Vault 7. Last year's CIA leak, that sounds like it could be a Fallout expansion. Ooh. bam -o. Vault 7 was a dump of the CIA's hacking tools that included vulnerabilities and routers and iPhones and Cisco switches and, you know, so they could spy on us or the bad guys. Predictably, WikiLeaks published all these leaks in March of 2017, and a week later, the FBI showed up at Joshua A. Schlute's apartment. He's the suspect. Did they get their man? I don't know. Who is this guy? According to his LinkedIn, I guess you can find out something there, he's a former engineer for the CIA and NSA. Can things get worse for Joshua? Lots worse. They found a 54 gig encrypted file at his apartment containing, any guesses guys? Any guesses? Ah, images and videos that appear consistent with child pornography. You can't sound happy when you say that, but this guy sounds like he's, whoo. So if you're gonna leak a bunch of CAA secrets, dude, at least don't be a child pornographer because, you know what? Don't be a child pornographer, ever. Even if you're leaking secrets. How about that? Let's try not being in a child pornography. So this guy is, he's pretty so absolutely beyond fucked. And finally, do you remember the first time you wanted to see a naked person? So you walked over to the newsstand, bought your porn pass, and then went home to a dark room to disappoint your parents? Well, that's gonna be the new process happening in Britain in response to last year's Digital Economy Act of 2017. Basically, the law requires adult websites to verify the ages of users, or these adult sites could face penalties up to 250,000 pounds. That's a lot of money. So these little porn passes, 
as they're called. Cost about 10 pounds and you have to show a valid passport or driver's license before you go home to stare at boobs or whatever weird stuff you're into. And it doesn't take a lot of creativity to imagine a demand for black market codes or kids sharing codes or sites figuring out how to circumvent this or I don't know, typing in boobs into Google and looking at boobs on Google. I don't know, did they figure that one out yet? Maybe, but there's not a lot. Hey, you gotta use big. Oh, I'm sorry, hold on, delete, delete. Caps, big boobs, so. There's, as an American, there's not a lot I can brag about in America right now, but at least we still have the unadulterated right to use our internet, to go on Google, look up whatever we want, except child pornography like Joshua A. Schlute did, and have some nice legal alone time at the locked door, and that, that's a wrap. Oh, thanks, Phil. Anyway, that's our show, guys. This episode was sponsored by Udemy. That's how you say it. Good. Uh, it's the largest marketplace for online learning. You want to expand your potential? Well, with over 65,000 courses starting at just $11.99, Udemy can help you develop your skills and to discover new passions. Students around the world have used Udemy to get ahead and even switch careers. Visit ude.my slash newsday or download the Udemy app to learn anytime, anywhere. Yeah, check those out and then check out a couple new episodes we have here. We had a Monday morning live show where we talked about Deadpool versus Solo. Which side are you on? And how are the Russians manipulating you into thinking that? Uh, also a brand new episode of Tugs where uh, the, the first casualty of the big battle royale war has happened. And you'll want to find out about it by watching more there. See you guys next time. Bye.